Hello guys, Sujara speaking. Welcome to OJ Peace Be Eyes episode number 1161. Now, it's been a long time since I did a reaction video on Purple Rose Podcast. And it's been like months since I've never done a reaction video on Purple Rose Podcast in like... How long do I react it for? Let's see. Purple... Um... Rhodes Podcast. It's been since June of 2022. Okay, episode 851. Okay. It's been since, um, hot, like, say, 100 episodes, a couple of hundreds of episodes ago about React. Since I never done a React video on Purple Rose Podcast. And today, it's finally the time. And today, we're reacting to Purple Rose episode 84, Rockapella, and Where in the World is Common San Diego. We had this beginning in five, four, three, two, one, go. I'm gonna turn this up a little bit. I'm Carrie Stinson, and my journey through life has been quite an adventure. For over 20 years, I played Barney the Dinosaur on tour, and seven seasons of the hugely popular TV show Barney and Friends. Now my journey is to bring together friends and guests from all over the entertainment world for inspiring and at times amusing behind-the-scenes conversation. I'm Kerry Stinson, and this is Purple Roads. Okay. Welcome to Purple Roads. My name is Kerry Stinson. You are too small, Kerry, unfortunately. Yeah, I can tell you are. And as always, I'm thrilled to have you here. This is something we've never done before. We've never had such a big group of people, but this is so cool. I've been wanting to do this for so long, and I'm thrilled to introduce Rockapella. Guys, how are you? Mm. Good. Wow, oh, okay, it makes more sense. Good to you, Juan. It's good to be is, one, is, is one of the two current members of Rockefeller going to issue the disclaimer now that we're not actually Rockefeller? Wow. I'm kidding, you are definitely still no, Rockefeller. Okay. Rockefeller. Rockefeller has 50 members now, come on. The impossible yeah. have followed. Yeah, Carrie, technically, with, this, is the, this is the version of Rockefeller that was on Where in the World is Covered San Diego. Okay. The current version of Rockefeller is uh, with Scott and Jeff and three other guys. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and have current, old, and Carmen San Diego. Carmen yeah. San Diego is something I absolutely love. Uh, it mm. came out about the time that I was doing, I started doing Barney. Wow. And it was just, to me, one of the coolest shows. And uh, I've had Howard Blumenthal on. We've had Greg Lee on. And it's absolutely amazing how all of this wow. happened how this show came together. So I'd love to kind of start off with how you guys got together and got involved with Carmen San Diego. Oh, man. Well, I, I wasn't there. I mean, I just popped in when it started. Are you on a ticket? <laughs> well, it started with Spike Lee, actually. <laughs> we, we, were, we were on a, um, a, a kind of a rockumentary that uh, Spike Lee did for PBS called Spike and Company do it a cappella. Well, I did not know this. Continue on. That was basically Rockefeller's Hello to the World. And the producer of uh, Carmen San Diego, Howard, who you had on the show, mm -hmm. uh, saw us on that special and wanted us to be in on the ground floor as with, with the show as the house band. Partly because he liked what we did, and he saw us as a bridge to a larger family audience. He wow. thought that Rockefeller was just like kind of the perfect fit for young and old and everybody in between. And he turned out to be right. Yeah, I mean, when it, when it comes to that show, I don't think anything stood out more than, more than that song, more than what you guys were doing. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks, Sean, for that. We, we got really lucky in that they featured us singing the song live, well, lip synced, but they featured us with mics, supposedly singing the song at every episode, and the audience chants at our name. So it was a, an unusual, uh, rare spot um, of exposure. Because, you know, when, when do you ever get to see someone actually sing the theme song at the end of every episode? I, in fact, I can't. I don't even know another show that's ever done that. So we, we I, don't know, I don't even, I don't know. We weren't part of that decision, but mm -hmm. we were grateful. 
Not to mention that it really was groundbreaking in the sense that there had never been an acapella group that did the house music for any show. So mm -hmm. it was, you know, that was a first as well. Like the idea to have an acapella group do, be the house band on the show was yeah. completely yes. groundbreaking, I think, by Howard. Mm -hmm. One thing that, that was interesting, at least in retrospect, is that prior to that, we were not a, a, we had, did not have a family audience. We would sing uh, at private parties and doing nightclubs, but only for adults. In fact, our few interactions with kids were when we mm -hmm. would sing at a bar mitzvah, and the kids would jeer at us. <laughs> oh, so the idea that true. we would be cast on a kid and beloved by the family audience was strange because we always thought that kids hated us. <laughs> Well, you know, it's interesting you bring that up because I talk about that a lot on this show. Almost everyone that's ever been on this show that's in kids entertainment didn't start out for kids entertainment. You know, actors or voiceover actors or, you know, I was a musician. I was not a, a body actor when I got into playing Barney, but then it, it really changed my life. Um, wow. The way the kids respond to, to what you do and the feedback, it, it's really amazing. And you can see it with your show. The anticipation those kids had to hear you at the end of this end of that episode sing that song. What was it like for you going from adult audiences to all of a sudden having these kids' audiences? <clears throat> we really had to watch our language. <laughs> yeah. Oh. And you know, strangely, beside aside from the um, interacting with the kids, what you know, on, in the actual scene, we weren't allowed to interact with them off camera at all before the show because of very strict mm -hmm. uh, rules about game shows. The mm -hmm. idea was that we, you know, we might accidentally say something mm -hmm. or sing something backstage that a kid would hear and realize uh, was a clue for the, for the show. Mm -hmm. So we were shielded from the audience until mm -hmm. we were on camera. Mm -hmm. And then we were, you know. <laughs> it was easy for me because I just came out for working at Tokyo Disneyland and Disney World. so. I always mm. think for kids, so maybe I was, I never thought about the, uh, the problem well, between adult audiences and kid audiences. So. But yeah, it was it was really fun with those kids, though. The whole vibe and the song and the, it was really festive and a fun, fun it didn't feel, we've always kind of had the uh, audience everywhere but the, the crucial audience of like the 16 year old, 12 to 16 year old girl. But so it was to have these 12 year old kids and older it was it was it was a, a great marriage is it tough currently and and back then that you have one song that you know i mean you have all these other songs but you have one song that everyone wants to hear is it we hard to keep it fresh we have two there's also the best part of waking up is folders in your cup those are our two greatest hits it's a sad <laughs> state but that's what they want that you have to give it to them to last for 30 years Wow. <laughs> I mean, are you, are you, when you take Carmen San Diego, are you wanting to, to do something fresh with it or is it? We do actually in the live and the cut, we do it every show. We, well, I love it because it's not like we mm. do it seven times a day. Like I used to do Disney right. World shows. It's like one time, you know, each concert and we, we milk it. There's a drum solo with Jeff, vocal, vocal percussion, and we improvise and we made it into its own event. Mm -hmm. So I want to ask you guys individually, so, so, and I'll start with you, Jeff. How did you get into singing? And then how did you get into thinking, you know, doing an acapella group was what you wanted to do? Uh, in high school, I, I was listening to, to uh, the Nylons and people like that in the 80s that were, they're very... Hello? You cut off a second. <laughs> Continued into college, and I joined Rockefeller when I was 25. So I had come out of all that and was looking for something. And I co-founded a group in Boston, it's still around, called Five O'Clock Shadow. And I had started to do beatboxing in that, and it was a new concept back then. And Rockefeller had the foresight to think, well, that is a no-brainer for acapella. Whether it's the samples they were using before me or during me, they, I think, you know taking that plunge mm -hmm. it's such a given in the acapella world to have a beatboxer now but yeah acapella was really assertive with that idea so I myself doing this you know naughty thing uh that i had never thought i could make money at and i would 
I mean, this guy right here, kind of reminds me of Lars Ulrich from Metallica or something like that. And this guy right here is coming with the Chris Slay version. Continue on. Or Phil Salmon, oh yeah. Continue on. I joined the group about halfway through Carmen San Diego, and as I understand it, the producers didn't want to pay for the guy until the fifth well, year. So we were touring and doing media appearances with me, and I was like, well, this is interesting. And we would rehearse backstage at Carmen San Diego, and I learned a lot of the material that initial time in Sean's dressing room at uh, the studio. So that was my start. What about you, Scott? Uh, let's see, I grew up loving my mother's uh, 45 collection. She had a lot of songs by a group called the Mills Brothers from the 30s and 40s. Loved that male harmony when growing up, and then I loved like uh, the Crew Cuts and the Beach Boys and Bread. Um, and so I always loved that kind of male harmony vibe. And then Manhattan Transfer in the 70s, and then like Jeff, I liked the Nylons when I was in college. Um, so the Rockapella thing, when that showed up, they put an ad in the uh, backstage performing arts newspaper. They were looking for a certain type of tenor with a range and a vibe. And I was like, oh, that'd be good, because I wanted to move to New York. I've just been, been in Japan, like I mentioned, at Tokyo Disneyland. And um, came to New York, and it worked out. And I just, you know, seemed like the right fit. And that kind of acapella, and here we go. Elliot? Um, <laughs> so I started, I mean, I guess I loved harmony my whole life. I listened to the Beatles and Simon and Garfunkel and a lot of close harmony growing up. But, um, in high school I did, I did, you know, musicals and what we did musical review and, and, uh, I sang an acapella version of You Gotta Have Heart and, um, ended up singing a lot of close harmony in high school and joined an, uh, a barbershop quartet in high school. So mm -hmm. when I got to college, I wanted to sing uh, a cappella, and I joined the, the the acapella group at Brown, and that's where I met Sean and some of the other guys who started uh, rock cappella. Wow. And um, it just continued from there. My biggest, I think, my biggest a cappella influence was the Persuasions, and that was the sort of diversion point from singing barbershop quartet music to singing modern a cappella in a sense. And mm -hmm. But ultimately, there's something about singing close harmony, like just being, I feel like you're in the middle of the music and there's something exciting about a cappella mm. that makes you feel good physically. And so that's why I continue to do it. Mm -hmm. John? Uh, I started, um, I, I was, I noticed that I could sing and the other boys couldn't when I was in first grade. <laughs> And wow. I was like, huh, why am I the only guy who can carry a tune? It seemed like the other girls could carry a tune, but I think there was, a, there was a little bit of a stigma for boys singing. Like, that was something that girls should do. Wow. But I, I, that's the first time I noticed that I could do this thing that a lot of the other boys couldn't do. Mm -hmm. But I, I sort of ignored it until, um, until I was in uh, maybe uh, fifth or sixth grade, and I started getting cast in some some school productions and then I started wow. getting some uh, some female attention which was unexpected because I was kind of dorky and <laughs> nerdy and had big thick glasses and uh, and I just rode that I was like wow this is the thing <laughs> you know I, at one point I, I stopped singing for several years in high school because I wanted to um, was trying to be a better athlete and that didn't work out and when I uh, when I was mm. a junior in high school that's when I I first heard acapella music. I was, uh, mm -hmm. I was waiting tables at a uh, Catskills resort and there was a barbershop quartet in residence. And I mm. heard that sound and it just blew me away. Mm. And uh, when I got back to high school, I immediately, that's all I wanted to do was sing acapella. So I formed a little trio. And then when I got to college, Elliot and the other guys in, in uh, the Brown University hijinks inducted me as a freshman and that's okay. when I really learned how to how to sing close harmony. Wow. Singing a lot of barbershop and then Elliot brought the persuasions music to the group and so then we started singing pop and uh, and after college we pretty much formed Rockapella just as a lark, just to sing on the street and just have fun. 
There was no thought of television mm. or even money. You know, we were we were singing for change on the street just for fun, and uh, I guess we were we were good and we had a, a good sensibility, and then we started doing private parties and things like that, and so it's the whole thing. <laughs> the whole career is somewhat unexpected because I, I'm, I'm not a school mm -hmm. musician. I just sort of learned mm -hmm. from listening to the radio and uh, grateful that it still is going on. Mm -hmm. and, and Barry, and you've got you've got this voice. <laughs> you know. Yep, yep. When did you realize you had that deep voice? The day that it changed. <laughs> I was eleven. Oh my God. Wow. Yeah, it was, it was kind of a shock. I mean, I, I had always loved music. I, I, I'd been a, a really kind of intensely nerdy uh, musician. I, uh, I grew up in a, in a very artistic family. And, uh, I, my first instrument was tenor sax, which was my dad's instrument. Um, wow. And it, it, it was okay. It, it wasn't my thing. And I started playing the French horn when I was 10. And that opened a lot of doors for me. And then the next year, my voice changed. And I was still playing the horn, but I, did, I also did a lot of singing. I mean, 11 is still middle school. So when the, uh, the, the middle school choir director heard me talk, she just about peed on the floor. It was like, oh, bass, oh, bass, oh, my God. It was like, it's something I've never seen. But, but I really didn't, I, I didn't take advantage of the instrument itself until my mid-twenties. I, I went through music school, I got, I, I went to Juilliard, and, you know, it was very kind of classical, classically oriented in, in my profession, but I listened to a lot of other kinds of music, and I was also, I did a lot of ensemble singing. Um, a lot of it was really nerdy, like madrigal groups and stuff like that, but there was also a cappella, I sang in a, in a, uh, wow. a jazz the 16 voice jazz group for a while that was a lot of fun. Okay. So I would sing bass lines and bass trombone parts from Stan Kenton arrangements and stuff like that. Was that in New York? Yeah, that was in New York. <clears throat> um, made a couple of albums that uh, sank below the waves. Uh, but it was fun. Fun, uh, oh, yeah. And then one day I was uh, having breakfast in New York and you know, we're fast forwarding a lot of years now. Um, to, you know, what was it, 1988, and I'm reading Backstage Magazine, and I don't have anything to do that day, and there's mm -hmm. a little ad for an acapella group that is looking for a bass who can sing a low D, which is like, okay, that's kind of in the middle of my voice. We're good. <laughs> wow. Um, and I, I, I phone them up, and I go to this audition, and they open the door, and they, they at the time were Sean and Elliot. And Sean had this, like, I think it was kind of a cross between Bo Derek and a poodle on acid. So, it was like this big, wow. kind of teased up thing with frosted ends and, and, and his, the braids and everything. <laughs> I'm just taking a look at these two wow. guys. I was like, what am I doing? And, wow. And one of the first things they asked me to do was sing a scale, a descending scale or just keep on singing descending scales until you hit the bottom of your register. Wow. And so I started doing that, and by like the third scale, Elliot is laughing hysterically. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm, what's, what's funny? He said, I've never heard anything like that. <laughs> wow. And then yeah. he said, yeah, we, we really want you in the group, and I didn't hear from him for like six months. Uh, and then Sean, I was, I was in... Minneapolis, working with the Minnesota Opera, doing an experimental opera with like electronic instruments and stuff. Okay. And I get this huge packet of music from Sean, and it's all Christmas carols and barbershop tunes. Wow. That, that I'm now going to, get to have to like memorize this huge stack of stuff. Okay. And I just looked at it. And I stuffed it back in the envelope, and I mailed it back to Sean with a little note. It's like, I, I just can't do this. Wow. And Sean called me, and he he just really poured it on. And the biggest lie he told was that it, it's really not going to be a big time commitment. Okay. <laughs> so that was kind of the beginning of it. 
when I finally I many, finally got into the group. I can't tell you how many guys showed up to those auditions who said they were bases and weren't. <laughs> Which is why we laughed because it was it was crazy to actually hear an actual bass. Okay. <laughs> well, you had, been, was, you had to have been thrilled. Oh, it was fantastic! Yeah, we were. Well, it was like that when Scott auditioned. We, I think, I think well, there were 126 um, submissions. Oh. Oh, wow. On on tape, and we had to listen to all of them. And I think we had three guys, and two of them were just major disappointments and then Scott was like oh my god <laughs> yeah, where, right. did the, where did this guy come from I remember Derek wow. was, uh, after Scott auditioned it was in my apartment uh, in the East Village so while Scott is in we, we auditioned in my room and, and Scott in the room for a second and Barry just says to me what are you doing let's just take this guy right now <laughs> wow <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I remember that. That was that was. I can remember that your apartment. I remember that was a great because I think the night before I had seen you guys perform. Oh, at Green Street. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mom. And that was. I remember you were wearing. I think you were wearing a long coat. Was I? I don't remember that. But yeah. I remember wow. The evening. The I remember the weekend. It was quite. Uh, it was very cool. I was like, oh, this. Because I remember hearing your demo, you had made a demo of Zombie Jamboree, and the wow. intro was that, <laughs> it was like that, I was like, okay, there's something, that's something cool about that, this is like, this is a, this is something, so, mm -hmm. I re I'll always remember that weekend coming up, yeah, weekend, mm -hmm. seeing you guys and singing with you, and I think we decided there and then that let's give it a shot, mm -hmm. yeah, that was, that was fun. Yeah, yeah so I was like panicked at the idea of you like walking out. <laughs> but it was like that with Jeff too. We we heard we heard an insane number of people who said they were vocal percussionists, and there are even tapes that were became little self-referential jokes within the group. Well, also Bragadouche. You remember the, the, the guy who actually taught vocal percussion? He wasn't, he wasn't making percussion sounds. He was. Being onomatopoetic poetic in rhythm, you know? wow! So his triplet, his triplet, you know, tom tom run was bracket the douche. So Jeff came in and he was like the real deal. Oh, you're you're and, very kind. I was and, wide eyed and innocent, that's for sure. But, but you know, you wow. had time and you knew music. This is true. So yeah, what does it feel like when you guys all of a sudden go, oh, we, this is the group. We, we finally found out this is it. Now what do we do with it? Rehearse our butts off. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, when, when Scott joined, we were, oh, we had already been approached by Carmen San Diego mm -hmm. and uh, our, the previous, the high tenor before Scott, um, he was a lawyer. He was in law school and he decided he was going to continue with his law career. So that was why we needed to we needed to find Scott at that point. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, we just, we realized like, okay, we're going to be on a TV show and we, you know, so we got together and we worked on music and, you know, when we were, I think, I, I think we very early in the show, we had to come up with a lot of the music yeah. almost on the spot for the show. Cause we were the house band. So we were, and like we were thrown into a studio and just, literally writing music together the four of us while we were getting mm. there so a lot of it not the theme song but a lot of all the incidental music we just i think we came up with it on the spot and, and you know yeah every crook mm. had a theme yeah and where, every where did you pick those up at your apartment or where did we do that i thought it, i thought it was at a studio uh well, i remember i remember you recorded them at, at bob golden's apartment oh. his basement apartment yeah, oh, right. studio in his basement oh okay the upper west side but uh yeah, we just, and we, there was so much music, all these little, they were stings, you know, they weren't, yeah. they were like mini songs. And, um, <laughs> hey, it was, the, it was each, each, each bad guy, each crook had a theme song. Yeah. Then there was, uh, there was parting, parting gift music. So when, you know, when somebody lost and they had to like walk wow. off the show, it was, we, one of them we called 
Sadly, we call it good, goodbye loser. Wow. <laughs> And uh, uh, the wait, the uh, the waiting music, the thinking music, the think about it, you know, which was like uh, basically Bob, you know, what we were doing like a a fake Bob Marley thing. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But they gave they gave us a lot of um, a lot of latitude because there was time pressure, and we were the you know we were the musicians. And I remember Howard Blumenthal said to us, he said, "Yeah, when they turn in the concentration." part of the game, that mid game, when they turn over the warrant, we need you guys to sing something. So just as a joke, I, I said, how about the warrant? And he said, yeah, okay, that'll work. Um, <laughs> so, like, okay. So we did the warrant in three part harmony yeah. and then uh, the lute, you know, whatever the lute was, that was one of the best, that was one of the, our favorite things I think on, of being on the show was coming up with a list of actual things to say when they turned over the loot in the middle of the game. Yeah. In harmony. Yeah. We would make those up like right before the show for whatever we right that was fun. And try to get away with it. <clears throat> and that was just something you were used to doing, being able to come up with music that quickly. Mm. We know, I think it's, it's obviously a skill for you guys. You we know were, you know backstage at least I was hyper caffeinated. Yeah. <laughs> so we would have to get there really we would have to get there really early in the morning and they would throw a bunch of stuff at us. In the later seasons, sometimes they would give it to us before the before taping started. But it was very, very compressed. Uh, you know, some doing wow. up to five episodes in a day. Um, and uh, you know, mostly hanging out backstage and you know, okay, you're on now for for 10 seconds, okay, now you're gonna run through the set for five seconds. Now you're gonna do this musical clue that you that we had arranged maybe mm -hmm. that morning or maybe earlier that week. Mm -hmm. So it was a lot of you know, quickly, frantically rehearsing something and then going on camera and doing it. And um, you know, we were we tried to be musically as as uh, as accurate as possible. Mm -hmm. But on television, they never want you to stop a take. So Good. we had a we had some we had some little systems that if one of us thought that we had sung a, a bad note or did something that we didn't want to be out there in public, we would break down coughing. So they would have to restart the game. If we just said, Oh, we didn't like the way we sang that, they said, No, no, that's fine, it's moving on. Like all they they cared about the visual, but we wanted to make sure that we sounded good. So there were a bunch of takes where one of us would just start hacking. Wow. I never knew that. <laughs> I didn't know that either. I don't remember that. Thank you. <laughs> so it was always Sean. I thought that was a great question, Carrie, because before Carmen San Diego, we never had to come up with music spontaneously. And we never did, because we would just one of us would do an arrangement and we would learn it and then we would, you know, rehearse it and then perform it. Um, but when we hit, well, you know, when Carmen San Diego happened, it was fast and heady, and we had to come up with stuff on the spot. And so mm -hmm. we, you know, we just had to do it. And Sean and Elliot are so good at harmony of it, and the three of us were able to figure out the three-part thing pretty quick. I mean, it's not that. Good. And subsequently, I've learned that it's you know it doesn't always happen like that. So it's mm -hmm. it was really the the abilities of the mm -hmm. singers were were tested and they came through pretty much. Well, and how do you stay warmed up and make sure you all are in, I mean, if you're just running out for 10 seconds, can you warm up before that? And how do you make sure you're in, you're all together and in tune and- <laughs> Well, or, you know, it's you just really the wing of the that, that really relies on everybody being in peak physical condition, optimal vocal condition, and it's- mm -hmm. And young. <laughs> wow. That's <Okay>. redundant. <laughs> well, and, and this was in New York, correct? Yeah. So you've Barney got was, you, yeah. So you've got Union. Because we shot Bernie and Friends in Dallas, Texas. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> On Earth. Go back one. So, so you've got Union. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Good deal, Juan. Because we shot Barney and Friends in Dallas, Texas. <laughs> <laughs> That's Sean's partner. 
We, oh. we shot Barney and Friends down. I'm having a magic section. character, my singing friend. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so he says. <laughs> We shot Bernie in, in Dallas, Texas, so we didn't have to deal with unions. We could do multiple takes, and we could go a little bit longer. But mm -hmm. I've been on union sets up in New York, and it's it's a whole different thing. You really have to be on on top of everything that you're mm -hmm. doing. Yes, we we ended up at uh, Kaufman Astoria Studios in Astoria, Queens, in New York City, which was a storied. Uh, it was where the uh, the, Gratch bro the the Marx Brothers did a lot of their uh, movies were mm -hmm. shot there, and there were a lot of TV shows that were shot there. Later, um, mm -hmm. Sex and the City and The Sopranos were shot there. Mm -hmm. uh, no, they were shot at Silver Cup, but uh, Nurse Jackie and a lot of TV shows were shot at uh, Kaufman Astoria. But um, mm -hmm. it was, you know, so yes, everything happened in New York City. Mm -hmm. So when Howard's telling you guys what, what you're going to do, because talking to Howard's fascinating. I mean, the way his mind works and how quick he moves. Did, did you see this being a success, or did you just say, well, let's go for the ride and see where this goes? I mean, I don't think we had any idea that it was... We just made... We, I remember doing the pilot, and there was big anticipation. Is the show going to get picked up? So, you know, we had absolutely no idea... In fact, I didn't think I don't think that I really grasped the magnitude of it until the show had been on for a year and we did a show and we went out to Orem, Utah to do an outdoor show. Wow. Five thousand people came. Wow. And I was just blown away. I was like, Wow, all of a sudden we're the Beatles. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was the first show that we ever did where the screaming of the crowd was mm -hmm. louder than our stage monitors, and we were literally having trouble hearing ourselves. And we did that show with no advanced publicity. That was the power of the yeah. show. Wow. Mm -hmm. It turns out that the only Mormons really like us. <laughs> well, yeah, I guess, but also that's like the, that is the main family audience, right? That community. Um, does anyone else remember meeting Mary Kate and Ashley backstage at that show? Oh, wow. Wow. And the full out series and Mary, to Mary Kay back in action on, and Ashley back in action on two Disney days. Amazing. Continue on. I don't. Really? Oh, shit. Yeah, in my head, I was in. Very special surprise, ladies and gentlemen. Continue on. Mary Kay and Ashley, and they, look, they looked like toddlers. They must have been well, maybe God. six, but they were just these little blonde blobs. Oh my God. Oh. Leaning down and shaking their hands, they're just looking at me like. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to and I wish I had a picture of myself with a toddler, Mary Kate, and Ashley. I mean, they were, you know, they were like, they were still there on the show, but. Wow. Wow. Yeah, it was in a trailer in back of the, in back of the stage there. I remember that. We've been we've been back there a few times. Um, so Carrie, you say you're the body actor. Of Barney. I don't want to break any trade secrets. I know at Disney you can't really say you can say you're a friend of Mickey or you're right. a friend. But are you? Did you actually do the voice as well? No, just the just the body. Oh. Mm. Physically, it was it was without giving away trade secrets impossible mm -hmm. uh, to do to do both. Right. Mm. So there was there was another actor that was doing the voice. And uh, obviously, when we were, I toured for them for for years before I did Barney and Friends. Uh, on tour, it's lips. So you got lip syncing. I was lip syncing too. Um, but then on the show, it's it's live. So he's sitting in another room with four monitors, and uh, mm -hmm. and everything. Now the songs are recorded, but he can live uh, wow. ad lib. So I totally understand all the all those aspects you're talking about. I, you know, I just want to confess that, guys, that, I, you know, I do obviously do the body work, but someone else has been doing it with <laughs> wow. years. You're the body actor. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I got to talk about the song, the song coming together. Where did that all come from? Well, they, you know, they, they came to us and they said, we need music. And they said, we need a lot of music. We need a theme song. We need that, that, that. So we all sort of went our separate ways. And I came up with a few ideas. And I had very little songwriting experience. I think I had written three songs in college for some songwriting class that, that were 
terrible, but I had some some hook ideas, and I was friendly with um, a guy that I was in a duo with in high school and college, a guy named David Yazbek, who's now he's now one of the most famous Broadway composers out there. He wrote he he won the um, Tony for the band's visit, and he wrote uh, Dirty Rotten Scoundrels, Women on the Verge of a Nervous Breakdown. Um, uh, <laughs> Yeah, Tootsie. Uh, you know, so he was my 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 songwriting friend, and I I brought I I said, hey, they want us to write music, and I've got some ideas. Is any of these any good? And I played him my ideas, and he said, I really like this idea, and I'd love to work with you on it. So wow, like, okay, this guy he really knows what he's doing. So we uh, the the idea for the groove came from that there was a, a song on the radio at the time by this a group called Jane's Addiction called Caught Stealing and it was a really yeah. funny group. It was like dun, 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 dun. and somehow that became who up who I don't know how <laughs> no. I had that C D <laughs> the funkiest possible groove and it so and somehow it got sort of dumbed down into who up um oh. and we uh you know we did a kind of a quick and dirty demo. I played it for the, these guys. And they liked it. And we submitted it. And next thing you know, they're like, okay. But there was there was no way to know that, it, you know, we didn't even know if the show was going to go. So mm. we just this was just another piece of music. And it, mm. uh, it wasn't until they started featuring us singing it at the end of every episode and the audience mm. shouting our name, do it Rockapella, that that's when things really started to pop for us outside of the show. You know, started we started reaping the benefits of the fact that mm. everybody knew our name and everybody knew the song. I think mm. if the song hadn't been featured in that way, I don't, I don't think it would. You know, maybe mm. the show would have been a success, but certainly it wouldn't have had that spillover effect to us. Mm. Well, I, you know, I know that uh, for Barney, the "I Love You" song. Yeah. Something that you know, as you guys all know, everywhere we go, we uh, we were playing New York back in '94. Wow, which I was what? Well, actually, when I was in the court, well, I was it was one of my first tapes. Continue music hall, and there was a legal issue over that song at the time, and we couldn't mm -hmm. play it. And yeah. I mean, the whole show was just people were so upset, and yet, you know, how do you explain yeah. to kids why you can't do something? Yeah, um, and so obviously they worked that out very quickly, but it's one of those songs that you know I, I lip synced a lot over the years. But it's such a the, what it means to the fans is so in, it's so incredible, and I know it's the same for you guys with that, even though you're doing it a thousand times or or a lot more than that, mm -hmm. the reactions have just got to be really cool when they when they ask you to sing it. Oh yeah, yeah. it's cool. And, and one, Ever. Of our, one of our guys did a video montage of sh shots from the show, and it's so much fun to like. I like just turn around and watch the watch the tape edits because mm -hmm. the memories of those. Oh my god, they're just myriad. Because not just singing on the show, but we would all have little bits where we would be do something stupid, and there's a hundred of those. And I I can't wait till I'm like black and white, but when I'm 85 or 90, I'm gonna sit back and. Look at that crowd and go, God, do I really remember doing that? Wow. That was funny stuff. You know, it's funny. I was talking to Greg Lee, and he, he said he just tells everyone that he's part of Rockapella. That no one, <laughs> no one ever, read, ever recognized him. He just said, wow. I'm a sixth member. I just tell him about Rockapella. I'm okay wow. with that. <laughs> well, great. you know, it's, I was telling him, and it's the same for you guys, how that show works, and I know because of being in the business, how difficult it is. What, what he did and how he kept that show going. Obviously, Lynn Thigpen was, I think she's just absolutely incredible and such an important part of that show. And then what all you did, and I think it wasn't just you singing it, but the fact that you performed, if they would have just played it at the end of episode, I don't think it would have worked as well as it did by you guys performing it at the end of each show. Yeah, probably so. It definitely had an impact. And the whole dancing on the map thing, the kids dancing on the map was it's, it's amazing all of a sudden it became like you know soul train or something like that yeah <laughs> it's a big communal uh 
party at the end of the show. And Lynn and Greg are both so musical that they would do, we did stuff together periodically and they, they were really intertwined with us in a cool way. I mean, at the time we were doing it, I think it was, it was like a lot of work because we would, we would cram the whole season into like, I don't know, six weeks or so. They would get up really early in the morning and we'd have to put all these songs together and, you know, kind of walk, get made up and do your thing. And like, it was just a lot of work. I don't remember like enjoying it profusely at the time, but looking mm -hmm. back, I'm like, oh yeah, it was, that was enjoyable. Well, yeah, it's, it, it definitely looks glamorous, but, but putting a show together, now we were only doing one a week. Excuse me. Of course, we had kids and, and all of that going on, but it is, it's a, it's a lot of work. Uh, involved in that. One show a week? Yeah, we were doing one show. We were recording one show a week. So but then Monday, Monday, Tuesday, Monday, Tuesday. What? Uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Uh, Monday was rehearsal. Tuesday, Wednesday, and part of Thursday was shooting days. And then uh, wow. Friday, we would learn next week. But we had a different batch of kids each week. So mm. they would get be getting those kids ready. They were going to school at the studio. And then we had a different batch day. of kids for every show. Yeah, you know, we were doing singing and dancing as well, so mm -hmm. um, ch challenging, ch challenging. So, what was it like for you guys after you get out, of, you're you're done shooting, and you go out touring? And a little bit like what happened in Utah, you start going across the country. I'm presuming and having these huge reactions. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Yeah, huge, uh, huge family audience, um, and. What was interesting for us is that I, I think it, it, correct me if I'm wrong at the time, right, so Scott, when Scott joined the group, he, he had all these contacts in Japan. So because of Scott's contacts, we got a Japanese record deal. So we were going over there twice a year, recording albums for young adults, and it was more, it was a lot more glamorous. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's what we, we aspire to be, hip rock stars in America. In America, I felt a little bit like, ah, oh, we're sort of stuck being a family act. If only we could get those young adults like we have in Japan. So we had these two careers going on. And, yeah. um, and we would say, in America, we would say, to tell audiences, oh, we're huge in Japan. <laughs> I wouldn't say we were huge in Japan, but we definitely had a career. And in Japan, they perceived us as huge in America. Yeah. <laughs> um, wow. So it, it was... It was strange. Like I, I do remember feeling, okay, we've we've matched out this family act thing. If only we could get to the next level and become hip with the, you know the real record buying audience. Yeah, because we at that time, like, acapella was not cool. It was like no radio or record company would touch it really. So it was really an uphill battle for us in America. But fortunately, we had the outlet in Japan to. You know kind of be rock stars over there but interestingly like maybe 10 years later when we were touring in america or 50 you know between you know we started having much bigger audiences in america um at these big performing arts centers with a lot of now college students who were kids when they watched the show so as as the our our carmen audience started growing you know growing up we you know, our touring in America changed tr dramatically. Wow. Yeah. And that was fantastic. I mean, it was great. And, and it never felt like it was never, it was never an issue. It always felt great. Like singing Carmen, singing the theme song was always really fun. It was never like, a, oh, we have to sing it again. It was always right. like exciting to do it live, especially for an audience that really wanted to hear it. I mean, what was better than that? Yeah. Well, even though we didn't have the radio or record companies in America, it was still mm. really fun. We had a lot of fans, we had shows, and it was, it's never been, I've never been disappointed that we weren't, you know, Aerosmith mm -hmm. in the 90s, but. Ooh. Wow, the even though Aerosmith was there in the eight, in 70s, so there you go or not, which is no bands for me. Continue on. And fun still is fun. And, and I think a lot of those, uh, a lot of the uh, older Carmen kids are now, they have their own kids and they're, they are music teachers in some cases and they're indoctrinating their students into Rockefeller's uh, collection of music and that's interesting. And they'll confess it to us, like, I totally force these kids to listen to you, blah, blah, blah. It's very great. Okay. And we're, we're also, because of Carmen, we have found a lot of other television shows. We did uh, TV specials with... Whoopi Goldberg and Jonathan Winters 
Wow, the late John Winters, recipes to him. He did an interview with, with Jim Letter on... Well, Jim Letter did an interview with J John Winters in 1999 News Hour. Continue on. TV commercials on camera for Taco Bell. What else? Forgot. Yeah, wow, Taco Bell. Continue on. What's the PSA with uh, Captain Kangaroo PSA? I remember wow. that. Wow. My f um, Aunt Lisa... My mom, if you're watching this, for you guys, continue on. Yeah. Pro scan, man. Oh, yeah, pro scan. Pro scan television. You wow. Can't reach. They, didn't, they didn't pay us, but they, we just got a huge TV. Folgers. <laughs> Budweiser. Right. Uh, yeah. I think we, we did every pizza franchise. My number one favorite. Well, ow. Excuse me. My number one favorite food of all time. Wow. Continue on. A lot of, uh, I don't know if you've done this, Carrie, but a lot of corporate in the mid '90s. A lot of you know, very lucrative corporate things and uh, conventions. Where... Before Jeff joined us, we were four out of five doctors. Right. <laughs> <laughs> wow, a lot of drug launches. <laughs> a lot of drug, oh, a lot of big ones like Proscar, which became. Uh, Propecia, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. like, we did the uh, Zantac launch. Yeah. Wow. And the Claritin launch. Huge. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, but, you know, I, rem I just remember all of a sudden we went from playing cl little clubs of maybe 150 people to playing theaters of f 500 to 1,000. And that was just, you know, we were yeah. traveling with a road manager and a sound person. And that was kind of, that was luxurious mm -hmm. to, you know, play for big audiences. I, 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 I do. We, I did it with Barney uh, for five years doing those kind of, those kind of shows. And it, it's just incredible when you can get out and get and see all the fans. It's, it's real. TV show is cool, but there's nothing like performing live and getting that live feedback. Wow. Also at the time for us, it was a lot of it too was, was, you know, exposing a lot of people to acapella who hadn't seen acapella and that was really exciting too um you know the the whole world of modern acapella has changed radically since you know we started carmen i mean truly radically wow i so, think we had something to do with that i think you did too mm -hmm. <clears throat> so i know several of you are are all of you guys doing uh, fan conventions now on both we sides. haven't done one but I, we haven't done one yet. <laughs> we have um, to do it, but we, we haven't. Are, so, uh, yes, yeah, Sarah of um, uh, I forgot her debut. name. Debut. Um, <laughs> oh yeah, debut entertainment. So she, now she's she's pitching us to Comic Cons. Wow. Yeah, I've been doing, I was very excited about that. Continue on. Doing an exercise with my right hand just to make sure that I can sign that many autographs in one sitting. <laughs> well, it's such a cool experience, and, and what's going on is that everyone wants, those shows meant a lot to people, and what you did meant a lot to people. Is it, isn't it cool all of a sudden you see them as, as adults, you know, as, as uh, Jeff was talking about? Um, it's, it's kind of a cool thing. It's, it's kind of weird that they were kids, and now here they are, you know, coming to you. Uh, we, I get them for people that say, you know, I learned all about love from Barney. Oh. <laughs> Wow. A thirty-year-old that you know came from a divorced family or something like that. It, the impact is amazing. Have you guys seen some of that? Well, Everybody like, says they learned all about love from Rockefeller. <laughs> wow! <laughs> wow! Sometimes I do the math, and I realize <laughs> that the the target audience when we're on the show was something like five to thirteen, you know, or maybe five to fifteen. And I just moved that up 25 years, and I'm like, wow. So mm -hmm. some of the Carmen audience is fully middle-aged now. Oh, so every yeah. once in a while, if I'll, I'll meet someone who's, you know, 42, 43 years old, and they'll wow. look at me, and, and, uh, and I'll be like, okay, I think this is this is a Carmen San Diego watcher. <laughs> wow. But it also went far beyond that, because our demographic was interesting on that show. We were the... We were the most watched kids show by adults at the time. Oh, by adults without children. 
right? Yes, which yes. was, you know, a, a strange category to be in, but we were in it for some reason. Wow. We always appeal to lonely people. <laughs> <laughs> so what's everyone doing these days, Jeff? Uh, from a, I kind of returned to my uh, college education and went to studio recording for other people <clears throat> and video production, stuff like that, and uh, really ramped up um, in the past 10 years, and I've been able to do it for Rockapella as well. So, you know, you got to keep multiple irons in the fire in, in the arts. Scott? Well, uh, Rockapella is still, we haven't done a live show now for a year and a half, but mm. we're waiting at the ready. We have, there are some dates scheduled, and they're still, so far still, they're still intact in December holiday. We do have a whole holiday show we do. So hopefully we'll be back uh, doing live shows starting then. And then, and then there are dates beyond that. But it's interesting to see how the, the live touring business, how it responds to this last two years, really unprecedented. But we're ready to go. All right, everyone's ready to hear you again. <laughs> it's just, it's just been it's been crazy. Barry, what are you up to these days? Uh, well, I'm, I still do some singing. I, I've been doing voiceovers for almost four decades now, so a big surprise that is. <laughs> um, I've also been um, when when I got off the road with Rockapella, um, I, I retrained as as a therapist, um, so I I have a, a practice. And I mm. travel and teach a lot as well. It's really fun. And uh, what else am I doing? Well, that's really about all I can talk about, Stacey. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Elliot. Um, so towards the end of Rockapella, when I when we were still touring on the weekends, I would I started working on Sex in the City for three years as an accountant, and. Wow. Um, so I was an additional accountant. I literally had a crazy life where I would I would go to the studio and then go straight to LaGuardia, fly out to the shows, and then come back and go straight back to the studio. Um, so I learned how to be an accountant in the film business, and I have a business helping shows with their New York tax incentive applications. <laughs> it's a very niche business um, that I've been doing for the last 15 years. And I'm also training to, I'm planning, hoping to compete in the world championships in a sport called kick biking, which I'm, oh. I'm, a, <laughs> I'm a, I, I train all the time and, I, you know, I don't know how competitive I'll be, but I, that's my goal is I think the next championships are in Finland, so I'm hoping to make it. Ooh. Wow. Tell us more. A kick bike is, uh, it's the size of a bicycle but it's actually a kick scooter. So it has no seats, no gears, no pedals. It's just like a, like a kid's scooter, but the size of a bicycle. So real brave. How much it tell to be? to make to you why? <laughs> the wheels, um, like bicycle wheels. It's really fun. I ride it all over, you know, I, I, I'm working up to marathon distance. Um, wow. But, um, it's my, it's my, yeah, my sport of choice now. Cool. They, wow. they, they race all over Europe. In in uh, the Czech Republic, it's huge. Uh, <laughs> it's weird. You have to go to the Czech Republic to race. <laughs> no one has wow. them here. <laughs> hey, Sean, what have you been up to? Uh, so I left Rockapella. Wow. So now it's twenty. It's twenty four years ago. So um, I left Rockapella, and I. I started uh, recording my own songs as a aspiring rock star singer songwriter and put out several albums of original material. And then I was uh, I have I've had a couple of different comedy song acts um, wow. called Jumungus, where I put out a couple of albums wow. of original Jewish themed comedy songs. Wow! Uh, but it's all in my LGBTQ Jewish fans out there. T O M. Lately, I'm in two tribute acts. One uh, is called The Everly Set, which is a tribute to the Everly Brothers with that guy who I'm sharing a room with right now. <laughs> That's us. Oh. <laughs> um, 
And now we have a we have a new act called Forever Simon and Garfunkel. So mm. for the first time since I left Rockapella in '97, I'm actually performing for nice size audiences again. But it, I suppose you know when Rockapella performed for these audiences, it was it was it was like a lot of kids and their parents and the occasional grandparents. Now it's all grandparents. Like my, <laughs> wow. my audience, my audience is mostly the Everly Brothers audience which is senior citizens. Uh, but there's a big audience out there for this stuff and uh, we love doing it. And uh, it's so good. Hold, 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 hold your head high, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, you know, I've always loved singing in two-part harmony and um, and it's nice to be out there doing it in theaters again. If you have a chance to see this show, it is absolutely fabulous. Oh, thank you. Thank mm. you. Those, boys, those boys are very talented. <laughs> they sound they, they they just like the other, but even better. Tonight we're performing in, we're in Holyoke, Colorado. And then tomorrow we're going to be in New Mexico. And that's, I'm told it's a very long drive. So it's great. Mm -hmm. okay. That's the there worst thing we haven't played yet. New, New Mexico? Yeah. It's a beautiful place. I was there for a while. Got to get there before we stop. <laughs> oh <laughs> well i was there last month it's still there hey. it's still pretty hey. and i still i still sing uh acapella with um some of the some of the uh some other rockapella alums um and we have a group called the groove barbers so i still get to sing a few shows a year with uh and get to sing close harmony so that's always a pleasure <laughs> Well, I got to thank you guys. This has been a pleasure. It has been a pleasure. I I watch the show all the time. I love the song. I love everything you guys did. And I just can't thank you enough for being on the show. Oh, uh, thanks, Gary. Thank thanks you so much for having us. Really enjoyable. Well, I hope you guys get out there soon. I hope you can get to Comic-Con. I hope you guys are out performing. We want to see your show. I will promote you guys like crazy. And I just can't thank you enough. Thanks, thank you. Thank you, Kerry. Thanks for having us on. Well, thank you for watching a special Purple Roads. Remember to keep your eyes, ears, and heart open, and you'll find your Purple Road. We'll see you next week. That was Purple Roads, episode number 84, Rockapella. We're in Rose, San Diego, Carmen, San Diego. Excuse me. What do I think about this episode? It was amazing. So far, this episode was a success. That was LGBTI's episode number 1161. Hope you enjoy it. Stay tuned for the next one, which will be Purple Roads, episode number 85. Um, it's going to be something very different. Till next time, Sue Jones and Bobby, so baby, go, we got more LGBTI's guys to pursue. Till next time, out. See ya. time I failed to really understand it. I never sought to meet the maker of reality. The one who gave the life that which is always happening. But I tried all the time. Was I the one to see things as I do under the moonlight and the sun? Perception is the question, and the giver holds the key.